The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, I am so excited about our show tonight. I have been waiting and looking forward to this program actually for a long time. And we want to talk about Chinese tech in Africa and some of the tech trends that are shaping Africa as a whole. Some of it involve the Chinese, some don't, but there's a lot going on. But over the past, I'd say, two or three weeks, while you and I have been talking about debt and all these other issues, uh, there's been a lot of movement in the tech scene. Let me just kind of recap some of the, the headlines that we've seen just in, again, in the past two weeks, and it'll give you a sense of the momentum that is building right now in terms of some of the tech deals that are starting to happen. So... Uh, just uh, a couple days ago, Huawei, the giant telecom company here in China, announced that it's opening its uh, it's going to open a big cloud data center in South Africa, and that's going to be following the likes of Google and Amazon, who are also going to be opening Africa cloud service data centers. So Huawei getting into that game. The biggest news, of course, of the past couple of weeks, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, uh, who is going to be resigning, is dedicating a lot more time to Africa. He came to Rwanda and he signed a very, very big deal with uh, in Rwanda. Uh, and it was really was great about this was that it wasn't a charity thing. Now, Jack Ma has been coming to Africa for the past few months and over the past year and talking a lot about charity. But in this case, this was actually an Alibaba e-services deal to facilitate Rwandan e-commerce, particularly selling into the China market. We're going to find out a little bit more about that later. Uh, Boomplay is coming to Africa. Boomplay is a new uh, music streaming service from Transin. Now, a lot of people outside of Africa may not know Transin. Transin is a Shenzhen-based mobile phone company that nobody's ever heard of. But if you are African, there is a one out of three chance that you own a Transin mobile phone. It is that they make technos in particular, and they control about 34% of the entire African mobile market, which is absolutely amazing. And they are putting... Boom play right on to their phones. Uh, and that's a joint uh, venture they're doing with the Chinese online service provider NetEase. Uh, and then uh, earlier in the year, uh, Zimbabwe signed, the government there signed a deal with the Guangzhou based startup Cloudwalk to begin a large scale facial recognition uh, program. And that's also happening in South Africa as well. A number of Chinese AI, artificial intelligence, and facial recognition programs are starting there as well. So that's just a small encapsulation of just the past few weeks and months of what's happening. It is just the tip of the iceberg, Cobus, in terms of what really is going on. And that's why I think it's a topic that we don't really understand very well and one that we really need to spend a little more time looking into. Yes, I completely agree. There's, I think all of these all of these deals are also a reflection that that there's a lot of action happening in the African tech sector, you know, indigenously. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know the 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 growth of M-Pesa, the the micropayment service coming from from Kenya has really, you know, has really been big news, I think, over the last few years. Um, and it shows that not only that there's a lot of tech stuff happening in Africa, but a lot of it is directly trying to address particular African realities or particular African problems. Um, so it's not simply running after trends in the rest of the world. It's, it's innovating new trends and then influencing other markets. So in order to understand what's happening both here in China but also in Africa, we're going to actually bring you two distinct voices today on the show, one from Kenya and the other from Beijing. Uh, Kobus, you and I are pretty accomplished. We've been around for quite some time. Um, I've, you know, spent a lot of time with people with a lot of degrees and a lot of reputations. But I got to tell you tonight, 
on today's show, I'm a little bit intimidated by the credentials <laughs> that we're up against. Uh, let's first start with our first guest in, in Nairobi, uh, Harriet Kariuki is a native of Kenya. She is, let me just read you a little bit about her resume and you're going to see why I'm a little bit intimidated here. Um, graduated from Harvard with a BA in East Asian studies, then went on to do a master's in political science from Beijing University. She's now an emerging market analyst uh, in Nairobi who's dedicated to Africa-focused investment advisory and strategic consulting services. And uh, holy Moses. And she writes a lot on LinkedIn about tech and about innovation and about African agency in the tech space. Harriet, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Thank you, Eric and Corbus, for having me today to talk about um, the Africa tech landscape. I look forward to an informative conversation on the same. Yeah, it's really uh, it's, it's really fantastic. You talked uh, on LinkedIn, and, and I invite everybody to, we'll give a link to your LinkedIn page in our show notes but you're commenting quite a bit on on the African tech scene, and this is a space that you're spending a lot of time looking at startups and investment opportunities. And one of the things that you're doing is identifying opportunities for foreign investors, including Chinese investors, in the tech scene. Uh, recently, you you wrote a, a a post on LinkedIn called "Africa is Prepared for the Fourth Industrial Revolution," and and you highlighted in the beginning of that that Africa had been left out of the previous industrial revolutions and in many ways now is ready to catapult itself into the fourth industrial revolution. So I think it's a good starting off point for our discussion about an overview of the tech scene from your point of view, where Chinese fit into it and how that all kind of plays together with the fourth industrial revolution. In my article on Africa is prepared for the fourth industrial revolution, I look at how Africa has been left in quite a lot of revolutions starting from the first to the third. And the fourth one, which is mainly driven by emerging technologies such as big data, Internet of Things, robotics, blockchain technology, and artificial intelligence, we're seeing these technologies disrupting a lot of industries in developed countries, especially the manufacturing industry, which has led to loss of jobs. But in developing countries, um, they're, they're, on the other hand, on the developing in developing countries, these technologies are challenging the, tr the traditional approaches of going about age-old problems in sectors such as agriculture, financial sectors, healthcare, education, water, and energy. And the the problem with African and African governance is that most of the things that need to be done by the government because of the lack of, because of the weak institutions are not happening. And we're finding a lot of these emerging technologies being used to bridge this particular gap, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's, whether it's in energy, and they're helping a lot of people have access to basic needs. An example that is uh, that is worth noting is in, Uga in, in Ghana, sorry. In Ghana, they have, there's this company called Bitland. Bitland is using blockchain technology to ensure that land registry process is transparent and people have the right documentation to ensure that they, ha they actually own the land. And if you're familiar with the African um, land registry process, it's very, most of, in most countries, it's very corrupt. And a lot of people who think they own land do not actually own the land. So blockchain technology through smart contracts is, Bitland is using blockchain technology through smart contracts to come up with a process that is very transparent and ensure that people who own the land actually own the land. And this is extremely crucial to a continent that still uses um, land and especially title deeds to, to that, so that people can have access to credit. So as you can see, um, this particular emerging technology is not only unlocking the, making sure that people are, are able to own land, but also unlocking other different sectors such as financial inclusion. And another interesting company in Rwanda is called Zipline. Zipline uses drone technology to ensure that people living in the most remote areas in Rwanda have access to medical care through um, whether it's blood, um, whether it's uh, whether it's supplies, medical supplies, and drone technology is being used to ensure that these people um, are connected with these particular supplies to ensure that they have healthcare system, especially in Rwanda, which is one of the, which is a very interesting country to um, to to study into in terms of technology. So in both of these particular uh, case studies, you're seeing that imagine technologies is being used to help not only have people have access to healthcare, but also have access to ownership of land, which directly, you know, re di directly means that people have, uh, are able to not only push and promote the economic growth of different countries, but this is, as you can see, this is very crucial in terms of the development of the African continent. And how does China come into this? China is not only pushing to become a global leader 
in emerging technologies, especially in artificial intelligence. And this is happening through the government pushing for companies to, you, you know, whether it's through funding, whether it's through financing, but we're seeing a lot of companies such as Huawei, Tencent, uh, Alibaba, they're, they're emerging as players in this particular sector, especially in the artificial intelligence. But there's an opportunity for, this con- uh, for companies, um, especially tech companies in China, to not only invest but have a chance to, um, to come up with products and test them out in the continent. And there's, that's already happening. For example, in Zimbabwe, um, there's this company that is us- using, um, that is using uh, artificial intelligence to, to come up with a facial recognition system together with the government. And this shows that um, the African continent is a great place for investors to come invest in technology because you're seeing a huge consumer, you're seeing a lot of, um, you're seeing a population that is one of the leading players in the tech space, especially when it comes to consumption of technology. When it comes to mobile money, for example, Africa uh, Africa owns half of the life services that have that are to do with mobile money. So you have a technology that is not, you have a population that is not, not only technologically receptive of different techs that are coming out, but one that you come in and solve for problems that are actually, you know, that, are, that need to be solved for so you can unlock economic growth of specific countries and as a result, pushing for, um, um, pushing for economic growth of the entire region. So Harriet, um, I can see from the African perspective why one wants all of these investors involved and how helpful it could be to Africa. From the investors' perspective, and particularly from Chinese investors' perspective, what is the what is what makes Africa attractive to, for for investment? Why why invest in the African tech sector and not in the the lots of other tech sectors around the world? Um, something very important to note about investment in Africa is that yes it's heavily it's heavily risky it's a very risky move but China has been leading in terms of investing and pushing for investment and economic transformation in most developing countries and that is through infrastructure financing and infrastructure construction which has been which as you can see from numbers in Africa which um, based on our inf- uh, the current infrastructure funding gap China is coming in and helping bridge that particular infrastructure funding gap. And there's more opportunities for China to not only change the narrative about the debt trap narrative, but through investment in other things that are also very crucial for economic development, especially when it comes to innovation. Innovation is is key for Africa to uh, not only leapfrog from its different problems that are ailing it, and this is key. This is very. Uh, we, I mean, we have a lot of examples in the continent where Mpesa, which is a very famous case study used uh, to show this, where in in Kenya, Mpesa was able to not only um, make sure that people have most of the people are financially included through um, through very through very a very unique way through USSD so, so to ensure that there's a peer to peer money transfer. But this in in the current state right now we're seeing that mil- about approximately thirty million people of Kenyans out of forty million have access to Mpesa accounts, which is something that shows that innovation, especially tech enable innovation, is a great investment opportunities for companies and for um, especially Chinese companies uh, we, who are leaders in this particular aspect. And why I know it's 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 often the question of like the risk, but again, fast mover advantage where you come in, the risk is high, but the return investment becomes um, the margins, the profit margins are usually higher. And the thing about the continent is that because most of the most of these problems are across the region, um, so from for example, Nigeria's lack of energy or like low en- electricity penetration is the same with um, Zambia's low en- en- electricity penetration and the same with Somalia. So as you can see, the lack of most of this sec- the lack of most of these products and services are- is across the board, and that's why Africa is a developing continent. So um, when you come up with a product, especially products that are using some um, very very innovative models, such as uh, the pay-as-you-go model, for example, people are able. You're able to unlock the spending capacity and the consumption capacity of people who, most of them, are still in informal sector, so they don't earn money per month, but able, they're able to earn money per day. 
So how do you provide services to them that that is not only just because you're trying to move away from the narrative that Africa is an aid driven economy. Instead, Africa is a place that you can come in as an investor and invest. And this has been proven countless, a lot of times, countless times by a lot of investors who are coming in and uh, checking out a lot of money in terms of returns. And this is possible when companies come in and be very strategic. And China is doing is doing great when it comes to this. Tuanxian, for example, the phone comp- the Chinese phone company is able to bank on a lot of on a lot of um, on a lot of them is able to get a huge market share because it's able to localize this product. So how do you localize your products? How do you how do you come up with an effective and innovative way to ensure that you're serving several people in different parts of the continent? And again, using models that have been tested out, like the pay as you go model, where people pay as they go, just as the name says, and using USSD because we're seeing that a lot of people still have feature funds and, you know, agency model where you're seeing a lot of banks nowadays have agents. So how are you able to combine all these different things that are very specific to the African continent and using emerging technologies and localizing a product to ensure that you have a high return of investment? So Africa, it might be risky, but Africa is a continent that you can be able to test your product. And once you're testing it, you can be able to scale across different countries um in different in different in different parts of the continent and this is able to is an incentive for most of the investors especially chinese investors and again for the chinese government this is good for them to change the narrative in terms of um the narrative on infrastructure funding and corruption how can you change that using uh by by investing in innovation which is directly proportional to uh, economic growth of this specific part of the world so again Yes, investment is very risky, but it has high returns, um, which is proven by companies that are already here, from Huawei to Transion, which is a Chinese company, and different other Chinese companies in the region. Yeah, I mean, I've said this before in the program, and uh, and I'll say it again, that if there was a Nobel Prize uh, that could be given to the Chinese for what they've done in the tech space in Africa, I think they deserve it, and I'll make my case here for it. Um, The Chinese did more to advance... African ICT, inter- internet communications, telecommunications, than anybody else has, has done. I mean, from wiring up networks from Huawei, putting in cell towers to making phones that are now 10 to $30 in price that are accessible to building services. Uh, there's a new undersea cable coming from uh, Asia to Africa that'll connect into Djibouti and Kenya that'll bring bandwidth from the Chinese. Uh, from the back-end infrastructure all the way to the front-end services, it's mostly being led by Chinese companies. And the Chinese uh, in the developing world were able to do something that was a radical, radical transformation. They were able to bring the smartphone to a price point of about 60 to 50, 50 to 60 dollars. And that was the price point that allowed people to move from feature phones up into smartphones. And the next billion people became connected to the Internet. And it is it, I saw this in Vietnam. I've seen it in other parts of Southeast Asia. They're all on Chinese devices going on to the Internet. And I, that's again, I think that's remarkable. So. That, that's all the positive story, and there's a lot of positives there. And there's nothing that anybody can take away from what the Chinese have done. There's a negative story as well, and I'd like to kind of talk to you about this. When people talk about colonialism in Africa, they'll say Chinese are the new colonialists in Africa. I think that's complete garbage. It's ill-informed, in, in part because it's using a paradigm uh, of politics that is from the pre-20th century. There, we don't do that kind of imperialism anymore around the world, where you're totally taking over a country's administration, you're raping and pillaging the country of your resources, and, and you, that just, that doesn't, we don't do that anymore. However, and Kobus, I'm going to try and kind of coin a phrase here, and we'll see if it kind of catches on. Data colonialism, data imperialism. What that means is now the Chinese are going to give services, very, very low cost services, phones, 10, 15, 20 dollars. They may lose money on the hardware, but they'll collect vast amounts of user data that will be then monetized and sent and that money goes sent back to China. Uh, by the way, the Chinese are not alone in this. Facebook, Google, Amazon, they're doing it as well. And the war of the in the future will not necessarily be a political war or a military war, but it's going to be a war over data and artificial intelligence. Some will be aligned with the U.S., some will be aligned with the Chinese. Talk to me a little bit about the concerns that I know you have about the collection of data and who owns that data and who gets to profit from it in Africa and Chinese companies. As I mentioned, Eric, 
Chinese companies are playing a very dominant role in internet and mobile phone penetration in Africa. And this is evident from the transfer and holding phone that we keep on talking about that is uh, that is manufacturing phones such as Techno, Intel and Infinix that are very affordable. We even have phones as low as $10 and they're locally tailored um, with features such as um, multiple SIM cards, which is essential for the for a continent that um, that has very low electricity penetration. But going to your point about how data is the new form of colonization, just because there's a lot of tech companies, tech Chinese companies that are part and parcel of the continent, whether it's the phone um, that is coming with apps that are already pre-installed, such as financial services or the streaming app. So you're seeing that there's a lot of data that is going to be collected from this. Huawei, for example, is working with a lot of governments to help them with uh, digitalization of their countries. So there's that particular aspect of people. And it's of course, it's very important to start worrying about data and data ownership. And beyond beyond this, uh, I mean, the, the challenge there is that data is being collected by Chinese companies um, and and there's a lot of conversation on data ownership, and that has been evident from the uh, from the European Union's uh, and it's in and it's coming up with the G- GDPR, and and yes, there's a question on who on on how this particular data that is being used that is being collected from Chinese phones from from Chinese infrastructure tech infrastructure and how that is being used by the government, and and how our own governments are taking part in this particular process. But my thoughts on this is that there's a lot of opportunity for um, for for African data not only to help and not only in the past uh, in in the part of Ch- of China where it's key for China to be able to achieve its determination of becoming the leader of artificial intelligence where there is a need for diverse type of data sets to ensure that you're able to not only uh, you're able to create machines that are able to learn different and uh, different data and different cultures, different languages. So you're, be, you're able to create very robust um, AI machines for that particular purpose. So that is one aspect in terms of um, in terms of China becoming a global leader in AI, thanks to a lot of data that it collects from the continent. But on the other side, how can governments start gaining from um, from this particular data, how can you have tech companies uh, which are already very advanced when it comes to emerging technologies such as data analytics help a government, an African government, be able to understand, um, to, to to be able to use the data that they are collecting together with the with the Chinese tech companies to be able to read patterns and help you know help solve for problems that are ill in the continent, whether it's water and whether it's food, uh, whether it's um, infrastructure. So how are you able to leverage the Chinese tech companies that are collecting data to not only help the Chinese government become a global leader in AI, but also help your own government um, in solving for problems that it's facing and using analytics and creating all this, you know, coming up with data-driven policies and using the current uh, using China's, you know, leadership in this particular, in this particular aspect, and leveraging it to ensure that you're having a fifty-fifty win, and you ensure that you're having a very symbiotic relationship. So from that end, you're able to access this. But again, um, just as we know, um, any dealings with the Chinese government is not as transparent. So you're left with this point where you you're seeing a lot of Chinese tech companies coming in and collecting data, and we don't people don't even know where the data is going to because the entire process is not transparent. And something that we're seeing globally is that we're seeing um, the internet world divided into two. So there's this Western internet, which is dominated by players such as Google, Facebook, and you're seeing this China internet that is dominated by Alibaba, Tencent, WeChat, by Tencent. And given those, we're seeing that Africa is uh, Africa, which is which was predominantly, you can argue, which is predominantly Western, having a lot of tech companies or tech products that are from China. Now that you have the phone transition, for example, there's a, you know, in no time they, they'll come in with already preloaded WeChat, and people who are already consuming a lot of WhatsApp will move to WeChat. So you have this aspect of that China. 
um, uh, a lot of African population will move to the side of the Chinese internet side. So the Chinese data stream will be full of a lot of uh, African consumers. So how, has you, how are you as a government prepared to ensure that your, uh, your population data is being used in the right way to ensure that, that or not, you know, that um, your citizens are protected and by rules that you are setting yourself. So that's something that is worth noting and worth looking into. But beyond China benefiting from this particular relationship or this particular um, continent in terms of becoming a leader, there's other opportunities for government, as I mentioned, to be part of this particular, um, to be part of this by uh, leveraging on the skills and on the companies to ensure that they're using this data which is, you know, again, Africa is so hard to find data, but leveraging these technologies, these tech companies to come up with data-driven policies that will ensure that its economy is more prosperous. Yeah, I mean, that's a concern for... Uh, Kobus, I just want to get your take on something very quickly. One one point that I want to clarify is that the data, when it comes back to China, some of it, a lot of it will go to private companies, which will then have to make themselves accessible to the government, but it doesn't necessarily go directly into the government. It's a small distinction, but one that, that's quite important there. Kobus, let's pick up a little bit on, on what Harriet said about these concerns. Doesn't this come back down to governance? Uh Every country in Africa has the right to set rules and standards for what happens to people's data. Now, I'm not that optimistic that people will do it, uh, that governments will actually enact tough data privacy and restrictions. I just don't see that happening. But talk to us a little bit about the public policy implications of these kinds of issues that Harriet's been raising. Aren't, isn't it up to African governments to set the standards for what companies and, gun- and countries can do with their people's data? Um, it is in theory, but you know, a, a government is only one. A national government is only one component of a larger ecosystem, um, and it is, as you say, it is difficult for for national governments or even blocks of national governments. So, so you know, kind of regional organisations, for example, to really impose their own set of rules, because obviously the internet is all about free flows. Um, you know, so ironically, you know, China is one of the champions of of the idea that a national government should have larger control over the internet and that they you know that that the, the internet shouldn't just be one unified system but that should that there should be country specific kind of rules for particular parts of the internet um the the issue the, the enforcement of this is also very complicated, you know, because because internet economies are all um, are all integrated. Um, like you see, you know, the new data protection measures that have come out in the EU have actually made it quite difficult for a lot of of, of American websites that that traditionally operate in the EU to 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 you know to keep operating there in the same way. Um, and I've only, I've even seen kind of some EU users saying that they sometimes use VPNs to get you know to to access some American sites that are now harder to access. So it, it, it becomes really complicated. And, and I think in within the kind of ecosystem we're talking about, the African governments have relatively, le, you know, kind of less power than some of their other partners. Um, I think what the, what the real question then becomes is, how much of a hot button political issue it's going to become, you know? So, so African governments will, will only, I think, do the work of, of of trying to enact some of these changes if they feel a pressure from below. And actually, um, Harriet, I'd actually like to ask you, like, how do you think um, Africans, African citizens, are going to react to this? Do you, like, how much of a problem it, will it be, especially if it comes with a payoff of, well, you know, you can get a ex- extremely cheap smartphone and then some of your not even personal data but but say usage data you know like uh, and and surfing data might get relayed i mean like would many africans be actually very bothered about that do you think i would argue that at the moment a lot of conversation that whenever people are talking about china africa it's not on the data angle as it was you calling it data the new form of colonialism but whenever People or you know mainstream media they're talking about Chinese involvement in the continent. It's usually from the from the narrative that China is colonizing Africa in terms of resources, oil, um, minerals, agriculture, and agriculture and all these different things. But it's never from the standpoint of data. Yes, you're seeing a lot of countries, especially Kenya, for example, coming up with with laws um, that are uh, that are shipping the data protection for its own citizens, but. The narrative, I mean, I don't know what's happening across the continent, which would be worth interrogating, but 
Um, the narrative surrounding Chinese engagement and involvement in the continent is not yet on the grounds of um, the new form of colonialism, which is, as we call it, data colonization. Um, but I see this happening the next couple of years as we see a higher penetration of tech companies in the continent. So as, as you can imagine, if we have more uh, trans Chinese phones coming in with more in with more apps that are Chinese in the in, in the continent, you will have a lot of conversations on the both politically and on the mainstream media on on people being worried about their data being on the hands of the Chinese government. And yes, and this is more like a conversation that is happening in very, you know, in very few, very few spaces, but it's going to be something that will be very, um, that will be frequent as time goes on, as more, we see more companies coming in, working with governments, um, more Chinese, com Chinese tech companies coming in, working with different sectors and with that, there will be that conversation then. But for now, it's relatively just about China and its um, debt diplomatic relations, as well as you know the whole uh, the whole argument on on the new form of colonization by the Chinese government. But for now, um, yeah. But in the future, this will be something that will be that will be articulated. But going back to my point on how you can create a system that is, you know, in the meantime, as we. We aim to protect our own citizens. I think it's crucial for um, for a more integrated approach towards this. I know, as I mentioned, Kenya is already pushing for its own uh, its own local policies when it comes to data. But how can you create an aggregated approach to the same? How can the African Union, for example, come up with a with a policy such as the EU's policy to ensure that they are protecting Africans both in the diaspora and both here? Uh, to ensure that their data is protected, and that is, you know, setting your own terms, setting your own uh, your own conditions, and how you're protecting your own African citizens. And I think this will give it a huge more bargaining power compared to a country such as Rwanda or a country such as Kenya coming up with its own law that is, you know, trying to protect Kenyan citizens against Chinese um, against Chinese tech companies. So, how do you start? You know, how do you how do we push for an integrated approach towards? Um, data protection so that we can ensure that we have more bargaining power. That is, again, in the hands of just having as many players in the space. So having more African government stakeholders coming up with, uh, with, um, with you know, policies that ensure that their own citizens are at safe hands. Because right now, data is king and, and it's going to be so for the next couple of years and so, several decades from now. And it's about time that Africa shapes its own narrative and shapes its, shapes its own policies to ensure that we're not only just being exploited as, um, as it has been in different ages and different centuries, but we're able to control our own future and we're able to uh, and we're able to do that because we are set our own terms. And this would be extremely crucial given that um, Africa is going to be having one of the largest young population, and again, in the next couple of years, data will be key in terms of uh, in terms of business models. But how can you ensure that that young population is not exploited by all these different tech companies, global tech companies, Chinese companies? Uh, how can you ensure that is in place without without worrying about you know without using other people's policies, but having your own integrated approach and integrated effort to ensure that you're protecting both the present and the future population that is said to be very crucial to the um, the world GDP. These seem like early days for these issues, but again, with massive amounts, yeah, very early, but it's great that you're thinking about it right now because with massive amounts of bandwidth that are about to hit the continent with new undersea cables that are coming both in the East and in West uh, Africa, uh, these the whole game is going to change with more people coming online with uh, the median age in Africa is 18 years old. Obviously, 18 year olds, what do they like to do? Go online. So we're going to start seeing huge amounts of Internet activity happening. And again, thinking about the role of the Chinese, both in the good and also in the questionable. It's going to be absolutely fascinating to do. So, Harriet, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Harriet is an emerging markets analyst based in Nairobi, where she spends a lot of time looking at investments in the tech sector. Uh, we're so happy you had the time to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. When we come back after this very, very short break, we're now going to get the reverse view. We're going to go to Beijing and we're going to get the view from Beijing looking of, of the African tech scene from China. So stay with us. 
Support for this podcast comes from the Africa Channel Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Well, as promised at the top of the show, I said we would have two guests to look at this, one from the point of view of looking at the what the Chinese are doing in Africa, but then also we want to get the point of view of what's happening here in China in the African tech scene as well. And for that, we are so thrilled to have on the program for the very first time. It's really an honor of mine because uh, I've been following you for quite some time. Sarah Beatty, who is the China Director at Development Reimagine. You may know Development Reimagine. It's the development consultancy uh, founded by a good friend of ours uh, of the program's Hannah Ryder in Beijing. Uh, she's also the co-founder of Kente and Silk, which is an events organization that puts on absolutely fantastic China Africa stories, event series around China. These are these series which bring together artists, musicians, entrepreneurs. Um, I was blessed to be invited to to both the events in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, they're just phenomenal events. Zara, for her part, just like uh, Harriet, is uh, just an amazing, amazing, amazing resume. Uh, now, she too, like Harriet, is an Ivy Leaguer, but from a different school, from Yale. And she went to the rival school of Harriet in Beijing, instead of which is not Beijing University, but Tsinghua. So in many ways, we got two totally different rivals here. So, But we're thrilled, Zara, to have you on the program for the first time. Thank you for staying up so late to join us. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be on the show today. Oh, it's great. Uh, so before we get into the details of, of what you've been doing, I want to talk a little bit about an event that you have coming up. Uh, on November 22nd, uh, you're going to be organizing an event called Riding the Technology Disruption Wave in Africa. And then it's all about how is the continent with the youngest population innovating with tech and what opportunities exist. So you're talking about technology disruption in Africa, but you're holding the event in Beijing. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So I think to start, it might be worthwhile to talk about the genesis of this, which goes back to May. So in May, um, a few of my friends and I put on Africa Week, which was a series of events all around Beijing. And the aim was to promote positive engagement with Africa in China. Um, and the funds from the week uh, all went to the winner of a startup competition. Um, we had dance classes. We had events that allowed people to learn African arts, um, how to make African jewelry. It was a whole range of uh, cultural events. But then we decided that at the very end, we wanted to highlight the dynamism of the African community right here in China and just sort of... Uh, challenge the stereotype that Africans here in China are either traders or are just simply um, here on scholarship. And we wanted to show how young Africans in China are actually creating businesses, adding value to China's uh, burgeoning tech scene. Um, and so the funds from the week all went to this pitch competition. And we were just amazed by the applicants that we got. Most of the applications were from uh, tech companies. Um, and so it really started to highlight um, how Africans who young Africans who are uh, studying in Beijing and across uh, China are also taking part in China's uh, digital uh, boom and are tapping into the resources here to create businesses that can um, impact their home countries. Um, and in some cases are actually not even looking at solutions just for their home countries, but also solutions for China. Um, and we thought that was fascinating. It's a story that's not often uh, told. We ourselves were quite, uh, we were pleasantly surprised by what we found. Um, and so that was back in May. And we decided that we would do another event specifically targeting tech. Um, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people uh, common touch points. We feel some of the conferences which, you know, are Africa, China, trade events or things like that. They cater to people who are already um, involved in the space. But we want to try and get out young students, young professionals who might not necessarily be interested in Africa, but might be interested in tech. And so we thought we would have this event focused on tech um, with with the lens of um, African tech in particular and have it be um, a catalyst for a conversation. It's so fascinating. Um, can you give us an idea of 
some of the, the some of the specific kinds of of companies um, that you're featuring or, or, or creators that you're featuring. What are what are some of the some of the specific kind of services um, that they that they developing? Sure. So for the pitch competition, for example, we had one company called Circle Africa Tours, which uses uh, virtual reality to provide uh, China, potential Chinese tourists with a view of Africa, and they're trying to fight the problem, which is people hear the word Africa and they assume it's. Um, you know, unsafe, um, it's unclean and, you know, all the negative stereotypes that come with it. Um, and so using virtual reality, they're trying to create, um, experiences so that people prior to their trips can get a sense of what like Johannesburg is like, what, uh, Cape Town is like and would hopefully then be interested in signing onto a program. And so they're in the process of developing that. Another company is, uh, taking, uh, China's um, you know, slight obsession with games to try and create an app that, uh, gamifies recycling. And so people are incentivized to, uh, to, to recycle and to manage their trash better. Um, and so they were testing this out here in China and we're hoping to then take it to their home country back in Eritrea. Uh, for the event that we are hosting on the 22nd, uh, what we're doing is we have uh, two uh, speakers. One is a professor who heads up the Silicon Cape Initiative, um, and she is helping to paint the picture of Africa's uh, tech ecosystem to give participants um, a contextual understanding of how Africa African companies are innovating, the various tech hubs along the, around the continent, and what opportunities might exist. And she'll be focusing on a few case studies. We're also highlighting a, an entrepreneur who um, has a company called Education for Ethiopia, which is uh, creating locally relevant content and distributing via um, mobile apps. Um, and so those are two examples of, of companies that or yeah, companies that will be will be featuring. And interestingly, Education for Ethiopia is creating a content that uh, helps Amharic learners learn Mandarin because they recognize that uh, with China's increasing investment in Ethiopia, there is a strong need for um, Mandarin-able uh, Ethiopian youth. And so they're leveraging technology to increase access to uh, language learning material. You know, you live in China. You've lived in China for quite some time. Um, I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. And when I go home to the San Francisco Bay Area, to Silicon Valley, I mean, no less than Silicon Valley, I feel like, you know, it's just a slow backwater. <laughs> I mean, there's just <laughs> nothing that compares to the speed and scale of what the Chinese are doing, um, whether it's apps, super apps like WeChat, whether it's e-commerce with, you know, Alibaba, whether it's just anything you want to do, you can do on your phone and it, it comes instantly. And it, on, again, it's hard to explain to people who aren't here to see it and experience it. You and I who live here, we take it for granted now. It's just how we get things done. Uh, but the rest of the world doesn't, they still use paper money. Can you imagine that, Zara? The rest of the world still uses coins and paper money, which is just so cute and quaint. Um, <laughs> so when you look at the at the speed of innovation and things, and in many ways because China itself is still very much a developing economy and a developing country, although you wouldn't notice it in places like Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, but the rest of China is very much a developing country, and it does have some parallels with Africa. What are some of the tech trends that you would like to see that are happening here be brought over to certain parts of Africa? Great. Um, so a few weeks ago, I spent time uh, with CGTN in Sichuan, and we were looking at uh, China's rural uh their efforts to alleviate rural poverty. And what we found was interesting was the role e-commerce is playing to really try and level out the playing field. And specifically, um, using technologies like, like drone technology to overcome some of the barriers that a poor transportation networks or very, um, very harsh geographical, um, landscapes are presenting these, these quite remote villages. Um, and I thought that there, there's a lot of parallel there. Um, JD has really mastered the art of delivery. Um, and so, you know, the, the, there's a really interesting stat that when the, um, 
iPhone, the, the latest version was released. It took seven minutes from the time someone ordered to, uh, to when they received it. Just seven minutes. Um, which is, which is just mind boggling. It shows the speed at which these companies are, um, innovating, but also leveraging technologies like, um, AI, which can help predict which buildings or which locales are most likely to, um, purchase iPhones, for example, um, and then using technologies like drones technologies to um, deliver them with speed. And so I think some of these um, technologies can really help um, African companies also circumvent issues around, uh, you know, traffic congestion or uh very bad uh, roads, um, and 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 so I'm quite excited by that. Uh, similarly, uh, rural Taobao um, has done a really amazing job of stimulating um, uh, commercial activities in very remote parts of China, um, and they've done. So- I think you're going to have to explain what Taobao is to people who may not know. Sure. So uh, Taobao is uh, some people will know of um, AliExpress, which is uh, Alibaba's outward facing platform. And so Taobao is an e-commerce platform here in China, uh, sells a lot of um, uh cheap to mid-priced products um, and you can buy literally anything you can think of on Taobao and it's delivered quite quickly. Usually in a day or two, you've received your product. So that's Taobao. Um, and Taobao has a rural facing component um, because they realize that rural consumers um, are consumers. Um, they aren't just simply there to receive um, handouts, but actually um, are, are willing to buy if they're given access. And so rural Taobao has set up centers across uh, these small villages um, and they have they, they basically aggregate products when they arrive. They also help uh, different villagers um, purchase online. Um, and they've also been able to support these rural uh, entrepreneurs sell uh, to big cities. And so you then have um, a town in Guizhou, for example, that was able to sell uh, over 80,000 bottles of spicy sauce uh, on Double Eleven a few years ago in five hours. And so that gives them unparalleled access to uh, consumer spending power in uh, big cities in China. And so I think similarly for Africa, uh, where we have different communities that produce uh, local products, um, e-commerce gives an opportunity to bridge uh, the gap, allowing them to access markets that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, in many parts of Africa, uh, products like agriculture products simply don't make it uh, to market. A lot goes to waste, partly due to poor transportation. And so I think learning uh, from China, especially around how technology has been used to um, address some of these physical infrastructural challenges could be something that would be really exciting and I would love to see uh, transfer. Um, do you find when you speak with with uh, people in the Chinese tech sector, are they um, as a whole already quite cognizant of, of potential uh, opportunities in Africa or are you still in a position where you have to explain, no, no, Africa does have the internet, you know, African people do have mobile phones, uh, you know, like how, how much do they actually know about Africa and how interested are they in Africa? Yeah, so it really depends on who you speak to, but I would say that overall people aren't necessarily aware of the fact that African uh, cities, um, African countries are, are are increasingly becoming these hubs of tech innovation. That is simply not on the radar. Perhaps there's an understanding that people have cell phones, um, that there's access to internet, but there really isn't a sense that you have African tech companies that are local, that there is something like M-Pesa, uh, that you have these locally grown innovations. That I don't, I, that is not my impression at all, which is why we're trying to have some of these events to just sort of complicate the narrative and highlight that really there are these innovations that are, are coming out. It's not just necessarily Huawei or ZTE in Africa, um, you know, supporting Africa's tech development. That is a true narrative, but, but there are also these local gro- locally grown um, innovations coming out of the continent um, that perhaps might even have relevance here in China. So um, in, in, in my opinion, technology in particular is one way that the Sino-Africa relationship can be more balanced. 
it, it for me is one of the it, it's one of the key areas where we could see uh, increased African agency, but also uh, more more of an equal relationship um, because innovations can come from the continent here. You have um, and you see this sometimes even in. Uh, you know, incubators here in Beijing or in Shenzhen, where you have African uh, CEOs or Africans who are leading teams and they have Chinese interns who they're working with or Chinese co-founders. And so tech in particular can be a, a, a level playing field. But I definitely don't think that there is, you know, mass appreciation here by any means of the potential on the continent or what is actually happening. Well, I guess that's what you're trying to do with these upcoming events like the one that you're going to be holding on November 22nd, Riding the Technology Disruption Wave in Africa. If people want to attend, our second largest group of listeners in the world is in Beijing. So if anybody hears this and actually wants to go, how can they go? What's the best way for them to connect with you? Great. I think the easiest way would be to look for Startup Grind, who is one of our partners. We're partnered with Startup Grind, which is a global organization. So if you search for Startup Grind Beijing and uh, Kinti and Silk, the event should come right up and you should be able to purchase tickets. Awesome. And we hope you'll make it. I, you know, I wish I was in Beijing for it. I've been to some of Zara's events. They are fantastic. And I think the best thing about the events that Zara has been putting on with Kinti and Silk is, well, part of it are the speakers. Yeah, okay. I mean, they're great speakers, don't get me wrong. But the best part of it, actually, is just meeting all these amazing people, young Chinese, young Africans, people from all over the world who are interested in this and passionate about the subject. So you have a remarkable ability to bring people together. And I think, to me, that is the the killer app of the events that you uh, that you put together. So, uh, you know, good luck with the, the upcoming event. Uh, Zara is the China Director of Development Reimagined, a development consultancy based in Beijing. She's a former uh, Schwartzman Scholar. She's worked with the, Belin the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a fluent Mandarin speaker, Yale graduate, Tsinghua graduate, and also the co-founder of Kente and Silk, who's putting on uh, this event and, on, and a lot more events on not just on tech, but also on China, Africa, culture, uh, e economics, politics, you name it. And Sarah is kind of trying to put these all together. Thank you so much for staying up so late with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. So a very positive conversation tonight about tech. Both Harriet and Zara seem very optimistic about the opportunities that are available. And, and there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, it is, it's an extremely exciting space to be in. Uh, Harriet was talking to us, you know, after the show about all of the different investments that the Chinese are making now in the African tech scene and little known that they are. And, and it's going to start raising the profile. That being said, Kobus, and we really didn't get into it very much tonight, but I do think it's worth mentioning. Um, there are a lot of human rights concerns about this. Human Rights Watch uh, did a report in Ethiopia about the new uh, monitoring and the kind of uh, the surveillance state that's being installed and the technologies that the Chinese are exporting, some of the artificial intelligence, facial recognition, those types of technologies uh, particularly in non-democratic societies with weak governance, weak rule of law, um, should be of concern. And that's why, again, just like everything in the China-Africa relationship, tech is neither good nor bad, but it's a very, very complex mishmash of both. And I think we can see in this relationship absolutely what we want to see. If we want to see that China is the best thing that's ever happened to Africa, I made the case earlier in the show that it is. Uh, if we want to see that China is the worst thing that's ever happened to Africa in technology, um, I think there's a very compelling case to say that it is because of the oppressive technologies that are being exported. And the last part that we haven't talked about is military technology. Uh, the Chinese are innovating in drones, uh, in cyber warfare, and a lot of this is being exported to Africa as well. So there's concerns that we should should watch out there. Now, again, countries have the right to buy uh, military equipment. They have the right to buy artificial intelligence-powered equipment. All of these things are not necessarily inherently bad, but they are and should be sources of concern. I agree. I mean, the, the, the bigger problem, I think, is that it's very difficult to be part of the, the kind of global internet-based or technology-based e economy without, you know, being harvested in some kind of way, you know. So it's, it's not, it's not if, if it were a situation that 
that China was particularly aggressively harvesting data or, you know, or that these kind of human rights implications only had to do with China, then that would have been one set of problems. But I think we have a much wider set of problems, which is that it's very difficult for anyone, you know, also in, you know, kind of in places like the US or, you know, Europe to to not also be, you know, you know you know, you know, subject to to similar kind of trends. Um, you know, we have we've seen massive data breaches with Facebook, for example, and Facebook doing very little to even really acknowledge that that you know over fifty million people's data, you know, essentially was stolen. Um, you know, so so in that sense, it's it's a very difficult question because it raises so many questions about what it's going to mean to be a citizen or what it's going to mean to be a full participant in the economy in the future. And it then also raises the question of whether privacy is still going to exist and whether our concepts of privacy themselves need to be rewritten. Privacy is a weird thing because privacy means different things to different people. The European definition of privacy is very different than the Chinese and Vietnamese definition. And certainly in Africa, there's probably a lot of variance in that as well. So so that makes it a very complicated issue. I'd like to leave everybody with a book recommendation. I just finished uh, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. And there is a lot of discussion about Africa in this book. It's by a guy by the name of Kai Fu Li, uh, K-A-I-F-U-L-E-E. He's the former head of Google China, Microsoft China. He worked at Apple. He's a venture capitalist now in China, probably the most famous tech uh, entrepreneur in China. And he really kind of paints a very stark world where basically, and again, there's a lot of implications for Africa, but the world will be divided into two. One will be controlled by American companies and the, uh, the rest of the world will be controlled by Chinese companies. And the data will be harvested. It's a great word that you used, Kobus, to, de- to, de- to decide this. And there is not much that we will be able to do about it in the world that we come up. Uh, the, those people will be subject to either American or Chinese technology, depending on what part of the world you live in. He also talks about how artificial intelligence is going to wipe out the path to industrial development, that there will not be the traditional path that poor developing countries have taken to produce textiles, then to shoes, and work their way up the food ladder, the food chain, in order to get to higher value goods because artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics will take all of those jobs. Uh, So there is a pretty dark future that sits out there in one scenario. And I really recommend to read this book because it gets you to start thinking about how Africa will be positioned in this new world order that we're going into uh, that is going to be heavily influenced, if not controlled, by artificial intelligence. Uh, So that'll do it. We were so excited to have two guests on the show. We went a little bit longer than we normally do, but we thought it'd be neat to get a perspective from Kenya and a perspective from uh, China for for today's show. And uh, so we'd love to hear what you have to think. You can hit us up on email, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. We're we're there every day, uh, 365. Uh, We don't take a break. We also have this fantastic newsletter that we're very proud of that goes out every Monday. Uh, We curate it with the best news of the week. And we select basically six or seven stories. We put an academic article in there. We put a quote of the week. So it's a really neat digest uh, to be able to just get your fill of China, Africa just once a week and without following it too closely. So uh, you can sign up for it right here in the show notes on the program. You can also sign up for it over on our website at ChinaAfricaProject.com. Uh, Copus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.